Uh, I'd like to call everybody's attention tonight to the College of Complexes, and my name is Tim. We, uh, again, I'd like to bring the College of Complexes to attention. My name is Tim. I'll be moderating tonight. Uh, the College of Complexes will be in uh, the following format. The first thing we'll have is a brief announcements period. The second will have a our speaker. The third will be questions and answers, and the fourth will be our infamous rebuttal period. We have two rules of the College of Complexes. One is one fool at a time. Yeah. The second is no personal attacks. And I'm just tell the Communist Party USA will share impressions from the visit by the Communist Party USA the delegation to Shenzhen, Beijing, and our third, our P province. John will, then, will address the implications of Trump's trade war, China's new economic policy and social reforms, foreign policy, and building an ecological civilization. Let's welcome John Bechtel. Just hit the space bar to advance the uh, thing. You can see what you're talking about on the screen. The same thing on the projector. Uh, okay. Hi, everybody. It's uh, great to be here. And uh, always great to, to be able to uh, break bread with you all and to you know discuss a lot of really important stuff. Um, I have to confess that, uh, well, uh, you know, Charlie really encouraged me to do a PowerPoint presentation. She said it's a lot more interesting. So, and I agree. And so I, I you know, put a lot of pictures together here, and with the uh, assistance of Charlie and Tim. And so we'll see how it goes. Unfortunately, it's going to be a little bit longer than what it might have been before. So I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, but it should be more interesting. Um, hmm. How do you get to the uh, print? The printed. Uh... <laughs> I'm not going to be able to see your notes. I was up front just playing at the end. We can do that. Look at that. I got it on my computer. I'm going to do programming. That's what it is. That shows me something. That is the best thing to do. People voting. <laughs> He's uh, still got some notes on his computer he needs to deal with. Just be a minute, folks. Let's welcome John Bechtel. Here we go. So China, China is a huge and diverse country with a long and very complex history that's undergoing enormous changes in a very short span of time. And I want to, I want to do a disclaimer here up front. I am no expert on China. In fact, there's probably a bunch of you here that know a lot more about it than I do. Uh, I was only, I was there for about 10 days this past May and early part of June in uh, Shenzhen, Beijing, 
Anhua uh, province, and also a little town called uh, Shio, Shiogang, which I'm going to talk about further. It's a very famous uh, place. So here's, here's my snapshot. Uh, I was there as part of a delegation from the Communist Party USA. Uh, you know, China was celebrating the 200th anniversary of the birth of Karl Marx, and there were all kinds of celebrations throughout uh, the month of May. And uh, one of the events they held was a conference uh, celebrating Marx, which in, in which they invited a bunch of political parties from around the world, and we were among those who were invited. And then afterwards, we took a little tour, you know, of these different places. So that's that's you know, again, it was kind of limited what I was able to see. Uh, I want to put um, you know these developments in context. Uh, um, this is an airport here. Um, I'm going to end up going through some of these photos rather quickly. This is the group that I was with conference and whatnot. So just a little bit of context. The uh, People's Revolution took place in 1949, and the declared aim and goal, of course, was to build a socialist society in uh, China. The initial model that they uh, patterned, you know, that they built it from was patterned after the Soviet Union's centralized economy that total public ownership of uh, the industries and so on, and, and an and a egalitarian approach, wage leveling, and also collectivization of the agriculture. But it was largely a failure, and a new path of development was charted beginning in 1978 that really went against what you would consider to be Marxist orthodoxy at the time. The reforms were ushered in in, in the socialist market economy and opening up to the global economy. And it turned out to be a big turning point. Um, so this was about 40 years ago. And so literally everything that's happened uh, well, it's really unprecedented what's happened just in, in the space of 40 years. China saw no other way to overcome its overwhelming agricultural economy. The reforms allowed China to accumulate capital by introducing a mixed economy, that is private and public, and becoming a low-wage manufacturing zone for the capitalist world. The, re the first reforms were carried out in the agricultural sector after 18 courageous farmers in the village of Chiogan signed a secret pact to split up the communal lands. And we met some of them. And this is this is actually these photos here were taken from Chiogan. And they had they actually had uh, left, you know, some of these this is the way people were living up until 1978 in these kinds of conditions here. And um, actually have retained these uh, buildings here as like a little museum. Uh, this is in, inside, you can kind of see the squalor and, and so on, one of the buildings. Very agricultural, but very, very underdeveloped. I mean, unbelievable, 1978, right? So these were, um, these were uh, two of the farmers, the courageous farmers that uh, we actually got a chance to meet. Um, most of them, of course, are elderly now, but um, most, I think, are still living. So what happened was that they, they signed the secret pact, these 18 farmers, to split up the communal lands, and they agreed to, uh, that the earnings that they would get after they would sell, they sold the crops, would be distributed to each farmer based on what they produced. Uh, so it was totally different than the previous system that they were, um, you know, working under. And the farmers were so fearful that they would be persecuted for what they were doing that they actually uh, took precautions in case they were rounded up and thrown in prison and made sure that their families were taken care of. Well. 
today they're they're national heroes, and uh, this is where this re these reforms are you know actually began. When when they introduced this uh, system, production increased immediately and dramatically, and the reforms were then by that time word got out about them and. Uh, Deng Xiaoping heard about them, and uh, they ended up extending them, uh, you know, quite extensively. Uh, first, uh, you know, regionally, and then to the entire agricultural sector, and then similar kinds of reforms to the manufacturing and service sectors. The changes since 1978 are really unprecedented in human history. I can't really think of another period where there's been so such a change in one country um, in the space of 40 years. You kind of have to, uh, in our own history, you probably have to look back to maybe the post-Civil post War period, you know, with the mass industrialization of the U.S. Uh, but even then, you know, it's it doesn't really capture, you know, what, what they went through. They left from an underdevelopment to a middle economy with a modern infrastructure. If you go there today, anybody who's been there today, you go to these major cities, there's no difference between these cities and Chicago or New York or whatever. I mean, they have all the modern infrastructure. Skyscrapers, subways, uh, you know, mass transit, um, uh, you know, you, you name it. <coughs> Shenzhen, which is the first city that we went to, and this is to give you an idea of how rapid this growth has been. In 1978, Shenzhen was a small fishing village of about 30,000 people on the Pearl River Delta. And uh, when they decided that it would become a, a tech center, uh, and so it became a, this is part of the uh, economic zone, you know, one of the first economic zones that was set up. Um, today it's a city of 20 million people, so 30,000 to 20 million. It's modern, uh, and I, I have a few pictures of it I'll, I'll show. Um, within a decade, China is going to be the world's largest economy measured by GDP. In that space of 40 years, actually beginning in the early 80s, like 82, from 82 to today, 700 million people have been lifted out of extreme poverty that is by World Bank standards, making a dollar ninety a day or whatever. And they, they are projecting that extreme poverty is going to be completely eliminated from the country in three to five years. You have to let that sink in a little bit. 40 years, 700 million people. I forget, it's like a, it's the majority of people who live in extreme poverty in the world um, you know, who have been lifted out of extreme poverty, you know, from China there. Most Chinese will live in a moderately prosperous society, that's their words, by the year 2020. Economic growth, I guess this year, I think it's, or they're projecting next year that it's going to go down uh, to 6.2%, but it's still around 65 and it's been averaging around that for a number of years now and accounts for 30% of global economic growth. The country poured more concrete in the years between 2011 and 2013 than the United States did in the entire 20th century. I mean, these are just like mind-boggling. This is just to kind of give you a, a flavor for what's going on. Wages, which are still low by U.S. standards, have risen by 64% since 2011 and are now on a par with Portugal and South Africa. <coughs> the public health system, I'm not going to go into all the different, because I don't know all the uh, details about the different services and so on, but the public health system, which is funded through employee, employer, and local government contributions, covers 97% of residents with a basic service. And I, I don't know exactly what that means, but it, they call it a basic service. However, there are a lot of gaps, shortages, and even corruption. And I don't know if you've seen some of the coverage, maybe the New York Times and some of the other media about lines and so on. Uh, part of this is because there's uh, also a competing private health care system that's 
also you know being set up and so if you want quality care you can't get it but you have to pay for it um, that is you know specialists and so on and so that's creating a lot of problems which I think we're going to try to uh, address the reforms ended total state ownership of the economy and strict central planning although there is still some planning and macroeconomic planning and so on but roughly still roughly 60 percent of fixed investment is still publicly in publicly owned and public, publicly controlled corporations the government directs social investment in education health care these are some of the, the housing this is in Shenzhen the government directs social investment in education, health care, housing, of which there are also still a lot of shortages and also high costs in some areas. Uh, housing is, is very expensive. And transit, which is very modern. I have some pictures here to show you. But also the government controls armaments, energy production. Uh, these are some of the older uh, workers' housing oil and petrochemicals, telecommunications, coal, aviation, and shipping. Those are all publicly owned uh, by the government. This is, again, Shenzhen, and it's a, it's a very modern city for the most part. Hold on, let me get out of the These are some of the workers in the hotel we were staying at. A lot of greenery, a lot of greenery which I'll talk about a little bit more too later. This is the subway system. Now in the lower right hand corner, it's kind of an interesting setup they have. You can see the doors uh, on the upper left hand they actually open these these doors open up. There's there's a wall, kind of a glass wall along the edge of the of the platform. It's a safety mechanism. It's like makes so much sense. And they the doors open up when the train doors open up, and then when the doors close, these doors close, and nobody everybody's safe on the platform. Here's a train inside. Bike share program like our Divi bikes. Just some outdoor nightlife. There's a mall. I didn't. I didn't take. of development came at a tremendous cost, including subsuming worker rights to overall development, growth of a capitalist class, which is the source of much of the corruption in China today, economic inequalities, urban and rural disparities, and of course severe environmental problems. This picture here, in, I think it was, this is in Beijing, this was taken probably about five or six years ago, um, maybe a little bit longer, but I'm sure all of you have seen pictures like this in a number of the cities. You know, this was the situation. You know, not only a lot of coal burning, but also uh, a lot of cars. You know, the, the introduction of the car culture brought a tremendous amount of pollution, pollution problems. According to President Xi Jinping, China is the world's largest developing country, but still, it's still in the primary stage of socialist development. It is, a, it is attempting to overcome what he describes as the contradiction between imbalanced growth and a rapidly growing expectations and needs of the people. So China's entered a new stage of development, and one in which I think, you know, it's going to include the kind of the leveling off of this tremendous growth, 
you're not going to see that same kind of growth going forward. It's going to be kind of a new normal in terms of growth. Um, so this new era that it's entering, uh, it's reached a kind of a qualitative stage, and it's carrying out some very bold new economic, social, and governance governance reforms that are going to extend decades into the future. They're they're looking at you know 2050, you know, and what was interesting, you know, is they they said that like I don't know 20 years ago I remember reading this that. It's going to take us a hundred years to build socialism, yeah. and I thought, God, that's a long time. I can't. I don't believe it. Why? Why would it take you a hundred years? And yet, by 2050, it'll be a hundred years. And I now I can understand, you know, the kinds of stages that and being able to, you know, accumulate wealth and, and capital and so on and be able to do what they're doing. It's taken a long, long time. But that's not the only thing. People have to change in the course of it, and I'll talk a, lot, a little bit about that later. These are steps toward building, again, what uh, the Chinese call a modern, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious, and social, sustainable, sustainable socialism by the year 2050. They include now this uh, project called Made in China 2025, which you probably heard a little bit about. This is one of the things that the Trump administration is targeting. This is what their tariffs are all about, actually. Um, made in China 2025 is a 10-year program to make China a global high-tech manufacturing power and radically increase productivity. <coughs> Today, it's about a one-third of US productivity through innovation and cutting-edge digital technology and artificial intelligence. Oh, that's, a, that's a bad slide. But you know. Until now, China has competed with other developing countries to produce consumer goods for advanced capitalist countries. And in the future, new industries will satisfy the growing, rapidly growing domestic market First, that'll be the primary uh, uh, task, and then compete in the advanced manufacturing and technological sectors of the global economy. Okay. To achieve this, China must create a world-class system of universities, research in institutions, and facilities, and hospitals to attack to attract world-class scientific and technical talent, and that's what they're doing. They're investing a lot, in, and they're really competing in terms of especially a lot of Chinese, you know, who had come here to, to uh, go to school and, and, and gain scientific knowledge, uh, ended up working here, you know, uh, because they, got, they would get paid well and so on. But now they're being attracted back, along with others, including top uh, US academics and so on, and, uh, who are being attracted over there with, uh, you know, pretty, pretty substantial salaries. There are a bunch of mind-boggling projects that are underway to modernize uh, China's infrastructure and relocate some 250 million people into what they call mega cities. For example, there's a new mega city, and I forget the other which cities there are, but it's Beijing and two other cities that are being more or less joined together. Um, and they'll have, they'll distribute up their, uh, you know, what each one of them does, like one will be a governmental center and one will be a cultural center. Anyway, you kind of get the idea. Um, and they'll be knit together with high-speed rail trains and, and so on. Um, but it's, it's, it's like they're, you know, they're organizing on a different kind of level, and they also have this problem because so many people have come in, you know, from the uh, rural areas over the past 40 years, uh, that there's been, uh, they've really had a hard time kind of keeping up with the development, so they're, they're trying to plan that a little bit better now, so that not everybody goes to Beijing or Shanghai or whatever. Um, this picture here is of a one of the underwater tunnel systems um, off the coast of Shenzhen there. I think it goes to Taiwan. Uh, but anyway, there's these enormous 
projects. These go on for like 50 miles, these underwater uh, tunnel projects. Um, they're building million people cities from scratch. And then, of course, you have, this is a, a cutout, kind of a, shows the different levels of these planned cities, you know, uh, going all the way down to the bottom there where the utilities are, and you can kind of get, a, get the picture there. Um, all right. Not a problem. Okay. So the other thing, the other uh, amazing thing is they're building this uh, uh, high-speed, uh, 35,000-kilometer high-speed rail network all across the country. And wherever you go, you can see the, the pylons going up, and it's really amazing. And I, I have a video here of Del Sheriff. stretches from the U.S. to Russia, and the aim is to preserve global domination by, uh, you know, the Eurocentric uh, states, including, you know, all across uh, Russia and Europe and Australia and, and so on, and, and of course the United States, and, and, and it's a racist concept that uh, was, you know, developed and being pushed by uh, Steve Bannon. Trump 
Trump, Trump's accusations that China is engaged in an election interference in the upcoming election is really an attempt to whip up uh, anti-China sentiments in the United States. With a string of military bases, U.S. imperialism wants, to, wants the ability to block China's access to Pacific trade routes in case there is a heightened conflict. China is, is challenging this threat by diversifying trade routes and building a military presence in the South China Sea. Of course, this led to, has led to disputes with its neighbors, including Vietnam, and while ten tensions remain, Vietnam and China are trying to resolve their differences diplomatically. With the collapse of the of socialism in the Soviet Union and in the Soviet Union, the United States emerged as the world's sole economic and military superpower and sought to preempt future rivalries by integrating Russia and China into the global capitalist trade system. Um, well, that also, of course, brought in to the global trade system uh, an enormous amount of labor, labor power. Hundreds of millions of workers were brought in, uh, you know, to the global system at the same time. It continued its Cold War-like foreign policy by expanding NATO eastward and militarily encircling Russia and China. But since then, changes in Russia and China, in Russia, uh, the uh, emergence of an oligarchic you know, ruling class and the looting of the country, and China with its modernization, mounting crises and of, of the global capitalist system, strategic military blunders, for example, in Iraq and so on, have shaken the global capitalist world. The neoliberal globalization of the 80s and 90s, was, which was characterized by deregulation, privatization, deindustrialization, dropping of tariff barriers, and a race to the bottom. China uh, believes that the world is entering a fourth stage of globalization. So this previous stage was, you know, the third stage. Um, but, you know, globalization has a long history. It goes back, you know, 400, 400 years. Um, and it's not going to end, you know, just because of what, you know, Trump's economic nationalism and the nationalism of some other countries. That's not going to turn around. It's a historic process that's going to go forward. Um, and, uh, so China thinks we're, that we're entering this fourth stage of globalization uh, that's marked by a multi, not, not unipolarity of one, one uh, economy or, or country dominating, but multiple, multipolarity, shared development and cooperation. The, ge the geographical center of globalization is shifting to Asia in the emerging economies. And this, this uh, picture here doesn't really capture it, but I forget, it's like half of all new global trade or whatever is among the Asian countries. So this is like, this is really powering now the world economy, the global economy, this region. So China and the emerging economies are ascending economies on the global, scale, uh, global stage and the U.S. and Western imperialism, uh, Western, country, Western capitalist economies are you know, having a lot more problems and are actually declining, you know, in uh, their ability to control uh, development. So whether this happens peacefully is really up to current and future U.S. administrations, whether they'll adapt to this new reality or try to resist it. And that was, you know, one of the things behind the, the Iraq War, the, U.S. ruling circles, and especially the neocons, didn't want to adapt to changing status of the United States, and so they they tried to recoup, you know, U.S. military and global power by launching this uh, war in, in in Iraq. Glo globalization will increasingly be dominated by a new set of of actors, and the goal for each country in that in this new era would be to improve people's lives 
instead of facilitating a race to the bottom, rebuilding domestic manufacturing, uh, and modernizing infrastructure instead of scapegoating other countries. And you can imagine if we had a trillion dollar program to rebuild our manufacturing sector and also to rebuild our infrastructure in this country, what, you know, what would, you know, the kinds of changes that could occur uh, here. As I said, there's plenty of work and wealth to go around, and particularly when you put it in the context of climate change and the need for uh, the world, really, uh, to adapt, you know, to climate change. You know, for example, here in the United States, you have, uh, we just witnessed these hurricanes and, you know, sea level rise and so on, and that's going to get worse. So we have to, uh, as everybody knows from the IPCC report, so we, ha we have to, now we're going to be forced to reallocate a lot of resources, you know, to adapting our infrastructure and society to this uh, climate change. China's growing um, economic role also means a larger diplomatic role, including in the Iran nuclear deal, the Paris Climate Agreement, and diffusing tensions between the United States and North Korea. China is promoting a new global governing concept called building a community for a shared future for hum humankind. The concept is based on multilateralism, fairness and justice in the global economy and mutual benefit, and win-win economic cooperation. It calls for working out disputes through dialogue, non-involvement in the internal affairs of other countries, and no Cold War type economic and military alliances, which is, I found that very refreshing because, I mean, everybody who remembers the Cold War you know, everything was a proxy. Everything was a proxy fight, you know, between the United States and the Soviet Union. There was always this two, the two global systems were in competition with one another. This is a totally different, and, and actually, you know, to be honest, you know, the Soviet Union, for example, the United States, both the United States and the Soviet Union were, uh, you know, uh, supporting different political forces in different countries including funding them and, and, and so on and so forth. This In this new concept, that is no longer the case, you know. That, that's, not, that's not something that uh, is tolerable in this, in this new kind of era and this, with this new kind of concept. So um, there's uh, collective security, for example, if there's problems with uh, local war or terrorism or something like that. It's based on sustainable development. Uh, cooperation to solve problems of development, climate change, peace, poverty, disease, resource allocation, and so on. Relationships are based on state-to-state -state and partnerships, uh, and developing, you know, economic uh, trade and so on between not only uh, countries but also regions. And restructuring of the international order, reforming global governance and financial systems that were established coming out of World War II, such as the United Nations, the IMF, and World Bank. China has already begun building alternative international networks and partnerships, and relationships including the Shanghai Cooperative Organization and BRICS, which is, uh, this is a picture of the presidents of the different BRICS, BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. By far, China's most, most ambitious project is the Belt Road Initiative. I don't know if, how many of you heard about this. It's, yeah, okay, then you're, you're, you're up on, on it, which is really good, which was launched in 2013. It is a massive $1 trillion developmental project comprising over 2,000 local construction projects um, in, I think, well, and I'll get to that. 2,000 local construction projects. It could, once it's completed, will, it possibly will boost global economic development by 12%. Once complete, um, 71 countries, this thing is going to knit together 71 countries in Asia, Africa, and Europe, including some of the very poorest countries, and will link 
They will be linked via six land and sea corridors featuring modern infrastructure, rail and road transport, modern ports, electric grids, refining capacity, water sanitation, pipelines, and cultural exchanges. The Belt Road Initiative is also a strategic plan to bypass any future threat of a U.S. economic blockade uh, on China's Pacific coastline. To help fund the uh, Belt Road Initiative, China is developing alternative financial institutions which threaten to upend the international financial order. Uh, I don't know, you probably have also read that um, you know, China's been accused of using the Belt Road Initiative to set so-called debt traps uh, with developing countries and exploit, exploit them like other colonial powers. Um, however, I, from what I can read and from what I've, I've uh, talked to when I was there, I talked to a few people, uh, from, their, from what they say, um, that's not true. And in fact, the loan terms for that China's extending and through these institutions is, are much like the IMF loans, that is low interest loans and so on. But they come without any strings attached, uh, including the imposition of austerity policies and, and that kind of thing. Uh, there, there were, there was a, uh, you know, a recent example of, for example, a port I think that was built in Sri Lanka, and the government there, which is actually a very corrupt government, uh, went into debt and um, over it, and uh, uh, the debt ballooned, um, and so they ended up uh, apparently. They work something out with the Chinese, so the Chinese are going to lease it for a period of time. But eventually, that will go back to Sri Lanka for like a dollar, uh, and uh, develop. After a period of time, they'll they'll actually have ownership of it again. So it's it's a different kind of uh, uh, setup. Uh, so I, that's why I don't I don't think it's the same as as the the debt traps that are uh, by these uh, Western. You know, Wall Street and other financial institutions. This is one of the ports. Another reform centers on shifting to a sustainable path of development to build what China calls an ecological civilization. And coming on what the announcements that um, were made earlier about those books, and stuff, uh, this is kind of apropos. This is a response to environmental destruction from in industrialization and the growth of widespread environmental movement and the goal of by the government to make sure that people lead a healthy life. China can't achieve its develop, del developmental goals relying on fossil fuel consumption. China is the world's biggest investor in renewable energy and will spend between Six, six and twenty trillion dollars to go green to build this ecological civilization, funding it with an environmental tax and other savings. By 2050, 60 percent of energy and 90 percent of electricity will be from renewables. Construction of 150 coal-fired plants has been halted, and filters are being installed on the remaining plants. Some of those have been reopened recently because of surging demand, but those, but they have an overcapacity as far as these plants are going to, are concerned, and they're long-term plants, so they're going to end up uh, closing them shortly. <laughs> China sells more electric vehicles than Europe and the United States combined, and passed laws to create a circular economy, reuse, recycling, and remanufacturing. Yeah, give me one minute. Nearly 300 eco-cities are being built, and a lot of the present-day cities, like, for example, Shenzhen, this is a building in Shenzhen, uh, are being retooled, you know, to become eco-cities. This is uh, one of the renditions of what they're planning on building from scratch. China is also carrying out the largest reforestation project in the world. The, these trees, I took this, these two pictures um, 
on a uh, along a highway uh, from Hope Bay to uh, um, Shiogam, uh, this little village that we were we were at, and all along the way, it's like a 50 mile road. All along the way, on both sides, they're planting these trees, and there's going to be a forest, you know, uh, about 100 100 meters or whatever on either side, you know, of the uh, this road. But they're doing that all over the country. A few years ago, Beijing was plagued with regular stand, sandstorms that originated in Inner Mongolia. And what they did was they, they built a, or they planted what they called the Great Green Wall. And they began reforesting these areas that had been, uh, you know, desertified and so on. And now it's been largely contained. You, you know, you're in Beijing. When I was there, the air was not that bad. I mean, I, I didn't really notice it any differently than Chicago or, or New York, you know. Of course, enormous challenges remain, and China produces more CO2 than any other country. And plastic is ubiquitous, which was kind of irritating, because anything you get is like in plastic containers. Uh, and it goes all goes in the trash. And of course, it's a major source of plastic you know, that ends up going into the uh, Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, and a lot of it comes out of the rivers, you know, along uh, the Chinese coast. Uh, although, as of this year, China will no longer import plastic waste from the United States and the EU. It was a major dumping ground for plastic waste products from all over the world. And they said, no more. We're not doing it anymore. And so now these uh, companies, global uh, sanitation garbage companies, are trying to find some new places to dump the waste. But um, they're, they're trying to take steps to, you know, Stop the, the production of you know the use of what they call single-use plastic and, yeah. and so on. And let's hope for for, for humanity's sake that they uh, succeed. I want to end with uh, just a few words on democratic reforms because I'm sure that's something that everybody's interested in. It certainly, was something that I was very interested in when I was there and didn't get a, all the answers I wanted, but um, there were a few things I found interesting. And I, I kind of came, I guess I came away more with a perspective than anything. China's experience with building working class democracy and democratic institutions is obviously very different from our experience and those of other capitalist countries. China is in the primary stage of socialism and remains a developing country. The way I interpret that is that it, it means that, that they are uh, um, at a primary stage in terms of building their material basis for socialism, which is really a precondition for achieving a people-centered society, and also in the uh, beginning or early stages of building democratic institutions, a civil society, and a political culture. Which is not to say that they, you know, there haven't been those things all along. I mean, as I, you know, they're very, you know, have a tremendous history and, and so on. But as far as, uh, you know, given the changes that they have, these modern uh, institutions and, and so on, I think they're at the early stages. China is, a, is an evolving, in that sense, they're an evolving socialist democracy. And the Communist Party of China freely admits that there's a lot of imperfections and shortcomings. If you read any of Xi Jinping's works, he, he's, he talks about a lot of the problems that they have uh, with de democratic you know, governance and, and, and so on. To me, to understand the challenges that they face, you have to take into consideration the following. Um, 2,000 years of imperial rule ended in 1912 with the Xinhai Revolution, followed by civil war, Japanese occupation, and World War II. So you're talking about decades and decades and decades of turmoil and war and, and uh, revolution and so on. The Revolutionary War for Independence resulted in the founding of the People's Republic in 1948 
only to be followed by more turmoil. That is the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, you know, which was, of course, disastrous. And, uh, you know, they, they, you know, we were at a museum where they were depicting, you know, the Cultural Revolution and the damage that it, it did uh, to uh, Chinese society. China didn't pass through a capitalist democratic republic phase. During its recent history, a single party, that is the Communist Party of China, emerged as the leading force. The dire conditions gave rise to, during this whole period, the, the Communist Party of China was built, was founded, I think, back in the 1920s. Um, but, the di but throughout this whole period of turmoil, those dire conditions gave rise to authoritarian tendencies, uh, which carried over, in my opinion, from the Revolutionary War for Independence and the establishment of the Socialist Republic and have, still have a legacy to this day. Besides extending basic rights to education, health care, affordable housing, transit, and a clean environment to everyone, there is the issue of the organs of people's government that allow for greater participation, decision-making, and management. In my estimation, creating these democratic institutions didn't really begin until the reforms of 1978. And even then, many things were subsumed to developmental tasks. For example, uh, workers' rights, you know, uh, and the trade unions, you know, they, they actually, you know, uh, you know, subsumed workers' rights to overall development and, and, and the global economy and so on. But what was what I found so interesting was uh, that um, you know they, they they say that people also have to change you know and in particular the mindset of people have to change uh, you know to uh, be able to participate in society at the, at that level and you know when you have a country that has changed so radically in 40 years that was largely probably 80 percent an agricultural society up until you know just recently now it's a little bit over half in urban society people still have the legacy of the old they maintain that legacy of the old and we met with a trade union leader and he told us that uh you know um they they, they try to negotiate these contracts with the foreign corporations that come in and uh you know, a lot of the, the mindset of people who, come, who are migrating from the rural areas is, uh, you know, once they're given an offer, they, they feel very uh, uh, thankful. And so they accept it, no matter what it is. It could be pennies, but they accept it. And he says this is a mindset, you know, from the old days that people have to overcome. But I think that that's probably true in a lot of different areas of society, that no matter, no matter how quickly you change the material basis, there's always a lag behind in consciousness and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that in another thing uh, as, I, as I close. China's system of elections is hierarchical. Each legislative body is drawn from the legislator, legislative bodies below it. Its system that is like the federal, you know, the national parliament uh, representatives come from the provincial parliaments and provincial parliaments come from the local uh, counties and so on. Its system of participatory and multi-party consultative democracy, including with the trade union movement, is unique. And I, that's, that is a feature that I think is really important. They have what they call this participatory and, and uh, consultative process that they go through where whenever they make a major decision, they, they try to involve as many different organizations and for, social forces as possible. National, state, and local direct elections are the goal, which of course will be free from the influence of corporate money. <laughs> the Communist Party of China is projecting other governance reforms that expand grassroots participation and, and decision making. An emphasis is being placed on establishing what they call a rule of law society that enforces the Constitution, a judicial system, and legal rights and consumer and, and environmental protections. They're having to establish a whole judicial system, uh, due process and, and so on. Uh, uh, 
And it, and it also includes reforms in the party itself. Uh, there, you know, was a lot of corruption, uh, as you probably heard about, um, and literally thousands of people have been expelled, you know, on the basis of that. Um, but also, they're trying to, you know, governing parties like that often turn into career ladders. That happened in the Soviet Union. And that's one of the things that really was so corrupting about it. And so how to prevent that, you know, set up some checks and balances and so on, I think is a real challenge. But also how to reinvigorate Marxism. That was their, you know, their guiding uh, philosophy. And that was one of the reasons why they held these celebrations in the spring. But they're putting a lot of effort into trying to reinvigorate it as, not as a dogma, but as a really a creative kind of body of thought. Personally, I can't, you know, I have a hard time seeing how you cannot have like a multi-party system, especially in a mixed economy like that, because you have so many different class and social forces. Uh, so we'll see, you know, see how that, that turns out. Although an independent mass media would emerged under Deng Xiaoping, reporters without borders ranks press freedom very low. And of course, there is a very widespread domestic social media, but Facebook, Twitter, YouTube are banned, and of course, Google you know, had their own arrangements to censor things and, and so on. And I can attest to that, because when I was there, I couldn't get on Facebook, and it was kind of irritating, to say the least. Uh, the, the free flow of information in a world of cyber warfare and mass disinformation is a challenge for every country. And we, you know, we experienced that in the last election with that mass disinformation campaign. Um, but I think that to censor just encourages resentment, and Chinese citizens are, in any case, they're discovering ways around the censorship, like anybody would. Um, and I think they will have to create a culture that emphasizes the free exchange of ideas and battle, battle of ideas. Women are guaranteed equal rights under the Constitution, but to be practiced by society, is, equality is far more difficult, as we know. Um, over 80% of women are in the workforce, but vestiges of the deeply patriarchal past remain, in, remain including widespread domestic abuse, sexual harassment, property rights, and unwanted, you know, this whole thing of unwanted daughters. <laughs> The presence of women in uh, commun the Communist Party leadership and among elected officials is scarce. I, it's only in the parliament, I, you know, it's very few. Uh, changes are afoot, including with a new anti-sexual harassment law, and women now make up over half of university students. Gay and lesbian rights also lag. I had a really interesting conversation with a young gay journalist, Chinese journalist, uh, who told me that attitudes toward gays and lesbians are much like our U.S. military policy, don't ask, don't tell. And then he told me that, you know, every year there's a courageous parliamentarian, a woman who gets up in the national parliament, and she, every year, she enters a piece of legislation, uh, you know, for equal rights for gays and lesbians. And every year it's tabled. And, uh, but he said that the, the, the really exciting thing is that among the young generation, these attitudes don't exist. They're very open and accepting and, and so on. So it's, it's a generational issue as well. And it'll change, you know, as the generations change. I think that in the end, though, also, it's going to take a lot of trans transformative social equality movements like the Me Too movement, marriage equality, movements to completely change attitudes and practices. These movements, many built through the social media, are present in China today. For example, in the labor movement, you know, there's, there's, all, there, there's been, in the last few years, there's been like a lot of unauthorized strikes and, and so on, and uh, a lot of it's been organized on the social media, um, but it's taking place, you know, and it's changing, it's having an impact and it's changing how people think. Finally, with respect to the national minorities, there are some 56 ethnic groups in China, with the Han group, of course, the dominant one, making up like 91% of the of the population. Um, but there, you know, you probably read a number of recent press accounts about mass, the mass detention of a million Uyghurs who are largely Muslim 
in efforts to indoctrinate them. Of course, I have I have no way of independently verifying this, but personally, I'm a little skeptical of a lot of the things the New York Times writes about China and also in the past about other socialist countries. Um, they tend to have an anti-China bias in their news coverage, so I'd be interested to get an independent or independent sources. Um, but there's no there's no doubt that there's been heightened security in that province um, uh, where the Uyghurs you know reside uh, which had, but it's a province which also has experienced a separatist movement over the last few decades including the separatist movement has on, on occasion used terrorism you know um, and from what I understand there's also concern that a, a number of these Uyghurs who have been radicalized you know went and fought with ISIS and are now coming back, you know. Um, so that's that's a, and they're going to put their training to use and, and so on. <clears throat> there are also other large, all other provinces with large Muslim populations that are not experiencing the same heightened security. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to see, you know, I'm anxious to see any other reporting on this. But one thing, you know, China is never going to allow the splitting up of its territory. It's just not going to allow that. And, you know, this whole thing around Taiwan and, uh, and so on, it's just, it's not going to, you know, the changing of the U.S. policy, it's just not going to allow uh, for the uh, splitting up of this territory. Um, anyway, I've gone on too long. That's a snapshot from my lens, through my lens. It's just scratching the surface. But I hope that uh, maybe it's been a contribution and that you also one day have the opportunity if you haven't been there already to see for yourself and draw your own conclusions because China no matter what we think China is going to play a bigger and bigger role in today's world and it's going to impact global developments uh, you know going forward in a much bigger way and we better understand what's going on over there if we want to understand our world that's me at the top of the great wall <laughs> That's it. I'm going to take some questions now. Oh, sorry, just leave, just leave it there. Oh, yeah. So the uh, speaker will take questions now. Yeah, you stay and, for questions. Uh, Charlie and the others, they have a show of hands. Do you want a longer question period tonight and a shorter rebuttal, or uh, a shortened question period and average rebuttal? What's the thinking of the college tonight? Because we're way, way short on time. This is almost normally when we start the rebuttal time. Five minutes away, something like that. So question. Shorter questions and yeah, lower rebuttals. Eight you know? o'clock, we'll switch from questions to rebuttals. Longer re and shorter rebuttals? Uh, what we'll do is we'll switch over at eight. Okay. I'll keep an eye on the clock. Switch over at eight o'clock to rebuttal? Yes, we got about... How many people roughly want to have a rebuttal tonight? Say something. Okay, yeah, we'll switch to rebuttals at eight o'clock. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Say about this. You got some Matt questions. First. Yes. Uh, all yes, very well second. and good what you said, but uh, one thing kind of concerns myself. Louder. And I'm sure. One thing kind of concerns myself and a lot of other people. I'm sure. In the past seven or eight years, uh, mainland China has been building artificial uh, islands off its coast. Some of them heading in the direction, so it would appear of uh, Taiwan, or Formosa, as it was once known. Uh, need we be concerned about a Chinese grab uh, of what they still consider, I understand, to be a legitimate part of China? And uh, do we uh, have to worry about a major conflict developing there? Because the United States and our allies would certainly have to take actions would that occur. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it's a big concern myself, and um, I think with respect to Taiwan, I don't really understand fully, you know, the history there. But from what I understand, there's been a, a process of integration that's been going on and is projected to continue into the future, where eventually that'll be, you know, one country. So. Um, but there's there's also you know with the Trump administration in particular you know they dropped the 
policy that had been in place for a number of years that respected that process. Um, so it's really the Trump administration that's fomenting this uh, in this period now, which I think is is dangerous. Um, you know, I I've seen it from two sides. You know, I for example, I know some of the people in the Vietnamese. Uh, government and, and so on and they expressed a lot of concern about this and were uh, really uh, rather upset you know when China started uh, kind of taking over uh, territorial waters that they considered their own you know and it created this tension between the two countries um, <clears throat> that's kind of gone on, on and off over the last couple of years uh, and, but they're trying to work, trying to work that out. And uh, for example, at this meeting that I was at, a representative from the Vietnamese Communist Party was one of the major speakers there. So I took that as a good sign. Um, but yeah, it's it's and, and they're but they're again. I think part of what they're what they're doing is in response to what the U.S. is doing. And so it's how how to how to try to create a situation where we can tamp down on all this on both sides, you know, and, and, and demilitarize. Okay. No, no. Yeah, I think um, every 10 years or so, we have a depression, and I think a real big one is coming to the United States. It's about 10 years ago we had the downturn in the economic system, and what do you think that effect will have on the United States? <laughs> Question again about uh, an economic depression yeah. and how it's going to impact what the United States and China is doing. What do you think about that? How's it going to affect the two? Yeah, well, yeah, that's a really good question. That's way way over my pay grade. Okay. Um, but I, I, from what I am reading, that these tariffs actually are deepening whatever economic problems there are in the global economy and if there's going to be a global downturn this this will help facilitate them so this is nothing we want to see obviously and the united states and china have a very special economic relationship that's been built up over time you have you know within the global context but between the two countries they have this and so it's really hard to kind of change these relationships overnight and but it, it's not helpful another question Oh, yeah, you had a question. Why do the Chinese consider Tibet part of China's Vatican? What? Why is Tibet considered part of China? Yeah, I, that I don't know, but except that, you know, it's historically been part of that territory and so on. Okay, over, yeah. over here. Okay. You. Uh, what about... Uh, Hong Kong and Tibet. Yeah, yeah. I, those those are questions I don't have answers for. I'm sorry. Right behind you. Go ahead. The the uh, great leap, leap forward and the Cultural Revolution, 1952 to 1967, resulted in over 20 million Chinese deaths. W why did Mao do that? Why did Ma Mao? Uh, he wanted to get rid of these people. Yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's. It. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a. I mean, they 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 admit that that was a very horrific, destructive period of their history, and it really set them back. It set their development back a long time. But I mean, that was China. That was Mao's concept of socialism, egalitarianism, and and actually, you know, this kind of small scale production and, and so on, and uh, it was very destructive. David Travis, back in the back. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, actually, I have two questions. One is, are there any colored people in China? What's the other question? What's the other question? What's the other question? give him two What's your second question? What's your second question, David? Are you related to Victor Eugene Debs? <laughs> no. <laughs> Only spiritually. I mean, the Chinese people are people of color, right? So um, maybe not in China. Yeah, not in China, true. But you know, as I as I mentioned, that they do have 
uh, out of their population, 90% are Han nationality, and then uh, the other 8 or 9% are other ethnic minorities uh, and religious minorities. Uh, last time you spoke, you said something like, Russia was gangster capitalism. You just described uh, China as sort of progressive mixed economy socialism. Now, what is what is the United States? Are we closer to Russia or are we closer to China? No, oh, we're closer to Russia. We're yeah. a capitalist country. Yeah, straight out over here. Thank you. With a gang, with with uh, some gangsters in charge. Yeah, China. China yeah, I should say is. I don't know. I know something's going on over there. I'm not sure what, but you sort of elucidated some of this stuff. So it's growing. It's growing. Um, so my question is, what do what does what does America have to learn from China? It's not going to happen under Trump. But after after he disappears a couple of years from now. Yeah, well, I mean, I, some of these major concepts I find really fascinating, like the ecological civilization yeah, yeah. and the community for a sh uh, shared future, um, and just the whole, you know, public sector, expansion of the public sector, uh, the directed development, and, and, uh, and so on, public, you know, setting up public corporations, the innovation, really pouring a lot of money into innovation, all those things are really important. I've always said that you know we're going to have our own path to socialism. It'll be very different than yeah. uh, China or the Soviet Union or any other country because we have our own history and we have our own material. We have our own unique set of circumstances, and we build from those. The Chinese have built from, are trying to build it from theirs. So we'll have we can draw some interesting lessons, but it's largely going to be up to us to shape that future. Behind Tim. All right. Uh, John, did you, when you were in China, did you see any synagogues? Did you, did you hear anything about the Jewish community of China? Uh, you know, I didn't. I didn't. But I know that it, there is a small Jewish community. Um, but I, I didn't. I, I'm sorry, I didn't. Okay. Jim. All right. China has been ruled for, all without, for an almost 3,000 year tradition of Confucianism. Where do you think that plays a role with the Communist Party today? I mean, they've had like 3,000 years of emperors and this finally big code. Could that be part of the reason why China's prospering so much is because it's the same government they've had for generations in a sense? Uh, well, it's not really the same government, but it's they, they actually try to draw on some concepts of Confucius, Confucianism uh, and kind of meld them with their Marxist outlook. And for just as an example, you know, this whole thing with the ecological civilization and trying to create harmony between society and nature, that's just one example, but there are others where they really try to draw on that tradition. Gentlemen, right there. You, you, okay. Yeah. Yell it out. Yeah. Uh, John, um, as you say, it's a lot about China that we, you know, we're, we're waiting, we're looking, we're seeing what will happen. All the answers haven't been, all the, you know, the questions haven't been answered. But I, I'm really impressed about what they've done to uh, the advances they've made in eliminating poverty. And I really think that it has a, a great, um, it will mean a lot in the world, in the world, the elimination of, of that degree of China, of poverty in China, and for other countries to even look at some of the things that they're doing to, to do that. And, and um, it will seem based on that, that it will really be in our interest to really root for them to succeed. Okay, what's your question, sir? That's it, do you agree? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, in fact, I think they, they well, the question was uh, their their economic um, development, their, the great strides that they've made economically, isn't it in our interest in the glo actually the global community that they succeed because of what they've been able to achieve, pulling people out of extreme poverty? Absolutely. And uh, in fact, I think they're, 
you know, they will they will say that their model, everybody has to have their own model. They say that too, you know. Um, but that their experience is also probably useful for a lot of developing countries as well. The car there. Go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks for doing some rail fanning. We don't do enough rail fanning here. Uh, how was your bullet train ride, and what would you do to change the level of service or the quality of service? I'm assuming you were on. Yeah, the I took that. Pic I took that video. They have 17,000 miles of bullet trains. Yeah. So, how, what would you change or improve or about their service? Yeah, the bullet. Just the, not transit. The bullet trains. Oh, I mean, God, I, I, it's. I was like blown away by that uh, experience, and it was about a. Uh, I, I forget how it was. It was like a three-hour ride we took from to Beijing, uh, from Anhua Province. Uh, but it was just smooth the whole way. I mean, I just, you could bear it. And there, you know, like if you take the high, uh, train down to St. Louis from Chicago here, you know, you're going to get stopped and let the freight trains pass. And, you know, yeah, this thing went just like that all the way, you know. Freight separated. Oh, my God. It was like such a, and it was like clean and, uh, you know, just, mm -hmm. it, it was quite an experience. So I have to say. change anything. Yeah. A couple more questions. Kareem. Oh, by the way, just the, you know, they, they also, on these this first generation of bullet trains, they used a lot of technology from, I think, Germany. Uh, and the, but the second generation that they're building now, it's all Chinese built. Uh, the population growth. Do you think China's population will increase or decrease or remain the same? The human population yeah. growth. It, about the population growth. Uh, well, you know, they had that one ch one child policy for a long time uh, to try to slow it down. And now they've kind of relaxed that a little bit. But I, I think issues around population are related to development and cultural level and so on. In fact, there, you know, when we were when I was in Vietnam and even in Cuba, they were already experiencing the same things. You know, uh, especially you know women getting going to school and getting educated and so on. Uh, they're putting off uh, having families later on sometimes, not even wanting to have families. So they they're starting to experiencing that as well there. So I think that once as this development continues and become more and more of an urban society that population growth will stabilize maybe even decline charlie yeah john immigration from eastern europe has declined to almost nothing because the economic situation has improved however the immigration of the chinese especially into my neighborhood is astronomical which would not indicate that conditions have improved at all. Otherwise, why would there be such a, a tremendously ongoing influx of immigrants on a steady basis? Yeah, yeah that's a really good question. I mean, I, it may it may also be related, to kind of a similar uh, as the development of a lot of people migrating from the rural areas to the cities, you know, in search of better jobs. Um, so it might be a parallel development, and of course you also have a lot of uh, people who come, you know, who are who are coming here to study. Many of them end up staying. Um, of course, the Trump administration wants to curtail that as well. Um, so yeah, there's still you know a lot of people who are, who are coming and probably will continue to come for some time. Oh, you're in the back. So it's not all that great. So, the, the phrase, an evolving socialist democracy, I find very unpersuasive. If all the economic dynamics in the mixed economy comes from capitalism, if there's no independent civil society, really, in a very strictly controlled or censored press and internet, if it's still authoritarian one-party rule, uh, in what sense is this an evolving socialist democracy, or the ecological society, even with the air pollution of the eastern cities? Uh, well, I mean, e so ecological si uh, civilization, that's, uh, I think that's pretty evident. I mean, the, the, the reduction in CO2 emissions and uh, the steps they're taking as far as sustainability and investing in uh, renewables and uh, plants for these eco-cities and uh, high-speed trains and so on and so forth. 
mean, I think the direction is, is clear on that, and it's a national objective. It's uh, including the concept itself has been put in the Constitution of the country. So I think that direction is pretty clear. Uh, you know, as I said, I, I think that uh, with respect to these developing these democratic institutions, um, you know, there are, they are uh, unfolding a whole number of governance reforms now. So we'll see how they work out. Uh, I can only say that's what their, their direction is, that's what their thinking is. They, they feel they, they can't proceed without greater and greater participation of people in the whole process. Um, and they, they recognize the limitations, you know, of uh, the structures that they have now. Uh, but of course, and I agree, there's some very troubling things there that, uh, including the censorship and so on, which I don't have a way to explain it, except those are problems that they're going to have to deal with, and in the end, I think they're going to have to change. Uh, so okay, last say? question, no more. Mm -hmm. It's 8 o'clock. Yeah, no, it's not quite 8. Yeah. Uh, it's 8 one You've got the last one. You've got the last question. Yeah. I am impressed with the communism, you know, uh, you should be the UN diplomat there. But um, to me, the issue um, is, you know, with censorship, and I don't know if you comment on this, is, you know, Facebook, I, I read that it, Facebook and Google were started by the CIA. So I think the, the U.S. has a militaristic approach to everything that they probably are right What's to your censor. question? And um, question. so question. I guess I... How is it? I don't know. I guess I'm, is there a way that their peaceful communist approach um, could be better communicated to the U.S. so that we respond in kind rather than our militaristic uh, approach to them and lies about them in our media? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of it starts with people to people exchanges. That's why it's so important for everybody to go and see for themselves, you know, and draw their own conclusions, but also make make relationships, organizations like the labor movement here should be, you know, developing relationships with the trade union movement over there, cultural performers, uh, artists, uh, elected officials, different mass organizations. It's really important to have these exchanges so we really understand each other and learn from each other as well. Okay. Time to go to rebuttals. Give our speaker a hand. Hang on. Okay, it's time for the, the famous rebuttal period at the college. So uh, everybody that would like to give a rebuttal, uh, hold up your hand so I can get an accurate count. Keep your hands up. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, about three minutes, you think? Yeah, uh, we'll go try it. We'll go three minutes apiece. We're going to have a strict timer. It'll be projected on the screen. Please be concise. <laughs> okay, I just came over the um, BBC. In China, the wages are increasing about a hundred dollars a year for most workers in China. So uh, in the United States, people are getting less and less, and sometimes they get a little more, but then inflation seems to eat up the wage increase. So we're going down. Yeah, we're going down, and they're going up. There's a big difference. As far as uh, one base in the Chinese Sea, the United States has about 800 bases around the world. And it produces about 41% of munitions in the world. It's probably more now because Trump has increased that. So most of the munitions are around because they make a lot of money. The, uh, the government subsidizes that, and then it goes to other countries, and the other countries want to borrow money. It borrows money, but the United States tells them what to do with it, and what they do with it, they sell them arms. 
that's what the uh, increases in the, to other countries amount to. Another thing, China is increasing in other areas, and it'll take a lot of time. What happened, I think, in the Soviet Union, because I asked the Chinese uh, ambassador that was there, he says, I asked him why the Soviet Union failed, and he says, because the people didn't get any wage increases, and their standard of living never went up. Where in China, it's continually going up. So there's a very big difference. And as far as uh, socialism in the capitalist world, I think that'll take a real lot of time. And one of the things that I think will happen is we're going to have a real big depression in the United States. But the, th the trouble is that the social consciousness isn't there. But I think uh, people are getting it more and more because if you look at Bernie Sanders, how many votes he got, and he talked about socialism, and people are a lot more interested in socialism. I also read the... Uh, okay. Okay. We're, we're short on time tonight, so we'll, we'll try to give you a heads up on the computer. We'll try to contain your remarks to three minutes. All right, next, please. For a dozen people. Next. We're going to run over. Three minutes. You can see it here on the computer. Right here. Oh, yeah. I see. Okay. My name's Dan Weinberg. This is... Um, Sympathy for the Devil by Mick Jagger. Oh, come on. <laughs> well, this isn't on the top. Please, Charlie, Charlie shut up and let him speak. I'm oh, a man of wealth and taste. I've been around for a long, long year. Stole, stole many a man's soul to waste. And I was round when Jesus Christ had his moment of doubt and pain. Made damn sure that Pilate washed his hands and sealed his fate. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name. But what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. I stuck around St. Petersburg when I saw it was time for a change. Killed the Tsar and his minister. Anastasia screamed in vain. I wrote a tank. Held a general's rank when the blitzkrieg raids and the bodies stink. Pleased to meet you, oh yeah. I watched with glee while the kings and queens fought for ten decades for the gods they made. I shouted out who killed the Kennedys when after all it was you and me. And I laid traps for troubadours would they get killed before they reach Bombay? Pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name. But what's confusing you is the nature of my game. It's supposed to be for Just as every cop is a criminal, and all the sinner saints, as heads as tails, just call me Lucifer, because I'm in need of some restraint. So if you see me, have some courtesy. Have some sympathy and some taste. Use all your well-learned manners, or I'll lay your soul to waste. Please to meet you. Hope you guess my name. But what's confusing you is the nature of my game. Thank you. His name is communism. He was suffering from Chinese. That's capitalism. <laughs> All right, let's go. Three minutes. Three minutes. Can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, there's an old saying, keep your friends close to you, but keep your enemies even closer. And I include in that those we think might be our enemies. China has undergone, there's no denying it, China has undergone some major changes in the past 20 or 25 years. On the other hand, there are still things going on there that ought to raise the suspicion uh, of people all over. I mentioned the artificial islands. I mentioned the fact that the Chinese army has uh, 
an uh, inordinate amount of control inside China, even to the point where they have their own factories that allegedly use, I don't know whether you want to call it convict or slave labor, but these are things that I think should alarm anybody uh, in dealing with these people, but yet we must. 150 to 200 years ago, Napoleon Bonaparte said, China is a sleeping giant, but be aware when she awakens. She's awakening. Like it or not, keeping our ideologies aside, we have got to learn to live with that country and work with them as closely as we can. Because if we suspect that they're up to no good, and they may well be, and they suspect that we're up to no good, we're not going to accomplish much. But if we're watching each other, that makes honest men. And uh, really, this is an opportunity for the world, but it's an opportunity we will not long have. There's a lot about the Chinese regime that I loathe. They treat their people, or have in the past treated their people like dirt, especially the females in China. You know, uh, abortions for girls were almost mandatory under the old regime. Mao Zedong killed as many people in China as Adolf Hitler did in Europe. These are not things to be emulated. But sometimes we have got to deal with people that we may suspect or not particularly like. Now is such a time. I'd rather we learn as much as we can about China. I'd rather we live in many ways as closely as we can with China so that we can each watch each other. And that's the best way to keep gentlemen honest. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Next three minutes, please. Oops. Okay, China. Um, human nature, to me it's all the same, the same thing, all right? There's a book out uh, a few years ago, Sapiens, all right, fellow says in it, human nature, humans left Africa, crossed, crossed over, eventually they crossed over to Australia at the time, Australia had very large marsupials, very large animals, within, within a thousand years of humans, arriving in Australia, all of the animals, the whole ecology was gone. We are simply consumers as, a, as an animal. Okay. Then they cross, over to the, they cross over to the New World. At the time, the New World was full of mammoth elephants, okay, saber-toothed tigers, giant sloths. We had horses and camels here, all right, and they were all gone. Okay. We are simply, by nature, consumers. And whether you talk about, whether you dress it up as capitalism or communism, it's all consumerism, all right? When I heard just today that there's a program called 2025 where they hope to achieve the level of efficiency that exists in this country, the only thing I heard was more consumers, more consumerism, less people working, less jobs. I heard simply a consumption of assets, less people making more shit. Right? I heard nothing to be proud of as far as human beings were concerned. All right? If we had enough time for questions, I would have asked, are there any Amish types in China? Are there any people who live with a small footprint. I mean, what they're doing is just what people do. They're striving to be, you know, occupying apartments, occupying, going on fast trains, all right? They're just trying to consume. There is no savior there. It's the end of the world as we know it. Thank you. Next. Next. Come on, David. Three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't expect uh, to. Uh, when I came here, I was expecting the talk to be uh, kind of like Mao apologetics or something like that. 
And what I actually heard uh, really was more or less arguments for markets, arguments for free trade. Uh, so uh, it, communism is a very evil ideology and deserves to be eradicated from the earth peacefully. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yes. And uh, but if anything I heard today was it was just that markets liberate people, or markets create wealth and whatever. So thank you for doing a good job of uh, creating pre uh, free, you know, the benefits of free markets and free trade. I don't know why you're a communist. You should join uh, a capitalist or free market group and speak in favor. Uh, I think you might be confused, sir. Thank you. All right, all right, all right. Um, I wanted to give a plug for the Chinese. Uh, they've been through a lot of crap for thousands of years, and uh, for about 400 years, that's been because of, uh, or they've gotten a lot of crap from Europeans. Uh, there are many, many cities along the coast of China that were just taken over by Western powers. And, um, and for a culture like China that uh, takes a tremendous amount of pride and self-esteem and uh, does not like to lose face, that's been very frustrating for them. Um, they, there have been a lot of uh, countries that have sent um, the military to China to make sure that they enforce their, um, their economic interests uh, and I'm not just talking about Europe, but I'm not sure how many people have heard of the Boxer Rebellion um, during that time. The United States Marines were in Beijing. Back then it was called Peking. Uh, they didn't just send a handful, there were thousands of U.S. Marines in Beijing supporting the, inter the economic interests of the United States of America. So, uh, the, the, the history of China, the, there's a very long history of Chinese being very suspect of Western powers coming in and, and exerting their, uh, their influence in their own um, culture and economy. So, uh, I, I really do respect that. Um, uh, I think that the big difference, the way I look at it, the big difference between the U.S. and China is that in the United States we have a bunch of politicians who are in the pockets of the, the rich and the super rich who try to dictate their own uh, economic self-interest. In China, you have uh, the politicians are basically the rich. They're kleptocrats. All these people who are in charge have millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars and uh, when they want to educate their kids, they send them to the United States. So uh, I'm not a big fan either. I, I'm a big supporter of uh, uh, socialist type interests and in trying to support the middle class and have some kind of safety net for uh, the, the underprivileged. And, um, and it really uh, frustrates me when people use China as a whipping post when we can uh, do so much for our own country. I think that if I had my choice, I would um, use China as an example. I mean, China takes all their money and plows it back into their country, and it seems this country spends so much of its money on the military trying to control other countries. And it's, uh, I, I wish that uh, we could learn that lesson from China. And, um, Anyway, that's my point. Mm -hmm. that's good. Thank you. Okay, next. David Travis, three minutes, David. Thanks for reminding me. Uh, yeah, good evening. I'm David Travis, and I'd like to say that Albert Einstein said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Uh, communism has been tried all over the world. In 1917, Russia was communist. Uh, it didn't work out too well for them. Uh, Albania once condemned the Soviet Union for being too capitalistic. Uh, today, Albania enjoys a much more free market uh, society. Uh, China has undergone the um, the socialist thing 
since 1948 or 49 when they had their revolution. And they've continued to adopt more and more capitalist methods and continued to call them communist or socialist because China has this big thing about not wanting to lose space. So they continue to call themselves communist while they continue to go in the direction of greater and greater capitalist reforms. Uh, again, communism hasn't worked anywhere in the world, and it never will. And eventually, maybe, the people of the world will come to know this for a fact. And then, it'll, as I think it was as Ronald Reagan had said, that they should be consigned to the ash heap of history. <laughs> and that's it. All right. Next. Yeah. Reagan's on that ash heap. Wall Street. So uh, I guess uh, communism worked out well for China because they, uh, they're the biggest economic power in the world right now. So uh, it's kind of interesting to compare China to, the, to America because China is a com uh, country that puts money into infrastructure and development, uh, whereas we put money, America puts money into oil wars and letting uh, Wall Street en enrich themselves. So. Um, you know, uh, I hope you guys saw that PBS special about how Dayton, Ohio was destroyed when we got rid of all our, uh, you know, job, a lot of jobs went to China and Mexico uh, because of WTO and NAFTA. So I got to hand it to Trump on that. At least he's attacking NAFTA that was uh, failed. Uh, you know, uh, getting rid of a lot of good union jobs and enriching China and Mexico. So. Um, but yeah, Mexico, it's good to see, you know, they build bullet trains, they build transit, they have all these uh, renewable you know, structures out there and investments, and uh, all we do is uh, get involved in a bunch of oil wars. You know, it's too bad. And then, uh, and then we get screwballs with the casino economy in Wall Street. All right, next. <laughs> Of course he doesn't. He's a Sox fan. Mr. Yeah. Well, first of all, Charlie, it's not your turn to talk. All right. And you might remember the old saying, "Sorry, Charlie, only the best tasting tuna yeah, to be star kids." Um, with regard to what was said earlier about the hunting of the ice age animals. No one knows quite why the megafauna of the ice age disappeared. Yeah. It might have been to over, due to overhunting. It might have been to climate changes. We don't know. And we probably will never know for sure. Uh, with regard to the comments that were made about Marines and Beijing and the Box Rebellion, they were there, but I suspect it was probably in the hundreds, not the thousands. That's number one. But number two, the point was not inaccurate. This was also the same period and the U.S. Navy began uh, patrolling the Yangtze River with the Yangtze River Patrol. For those of you who have either read the novel The Sand Pebbles or seen the movie that was based on that novel with Steve McQueen and Candace Bergen and Richard Crenna, that tells the story of a fictional Yangtze River Patrol gunboat, the USS San Pablo, as its adventures patrolling the Yangtze River and its struggle against an increasingly nationalistic China Granted, it was the, the China of those days was the China of Chiang Kai-shek and not that of Mao Zedong. Um, and finally, I would remind certain people here that the rebuttals do not necessarily always have to be on point. How many years did we tolerate Doc Whitmore standing up here <laughs> and promoting his nine <laughs> Uh, so I'm sorry. You can talk about anything you yeah. want when you get up here. Yeah. Period. And We're not story. turning this into a poetry club. <laughs> no, we didn't. We go to the poetry group if you want poetry. Excellent. Well, okay. what, about, what about Doc Whitor? It's not poetry. It's a great stone yeah, song. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Okay. I really think what I said about Star Trek. One more time. Thank you. All right. Next. Thank you. Very good. Three minutes. Sorry to be so quick. Go ahead. This is my first time here in this fighting experience. I kind of enjoy it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think uh, the debate around capitalism and socialism and communism, communism will be here long after I leave this earth <laughs> and uh, probably uh, after some of you leave this earth and your children leave this earth. That debate will be going forward and uh, time will tell, in my, in my opinion, time will tell um, what is more accurate than the other. You know, so what we talk about, we don't talk about absolute truth, but in terms of getting closer to what is true, uh, I think time will tell. I have my bias, some others have their bias. But I think that the central question that we should really entertain that is really interesting to me about what's happening in China, as I said before, when you're talking about bringing that many people out of poverty, that is something that I think the whole world should pause and look at and say this is a damn good thing. You know, what's happening in the world in terms of how people are being forced to live uh, based on systems not being able to come together and figure out how to solve problems so that people live like human beings uh, uh, is a problem. And I think what's connected to that, that I think we need to really think about it, is Whatever you might think about the Soviet Union, they made a whole bunch of, it, of, of, of advances. But this whole question of armament and the military arms race forced a lot of money to be put into armaments. China has not gone down that road yet. And I hope that we can uh, make our voices heard that this country does not put pressure on them to go down that road. Let there be a battle of ideas. Let there be a battle of ideas, not one country trying to amass enough arms to uh, strike fear in the heart of another country or other systems or ideology. Let there be a battle of ideas. If, we, if China will not be forced to put all of their money into armaments, and I'm afraid that this whole thing about trade is going in a direction where you're kind of diverting Chinese money into other uh, areas of where it could be put into development and that type of thing uh, is a problem. I think that we need to really be uh, uh, worried about this position and direction that the Trump administration is uh, 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 going in. So uh, again, thanks and I enjoyed this talk and I think I'll come back. Good. Next. Thank you. Well, I didn't think I'd be back. This daughter hasn't been born yet. Uh, my name is Adam Hawley, local libertarian volunteer. Mr. Bechtel, thank you for your talk. Uh, even if I am a bit of a skeptic about the packaging, it seems, as I was telling Charlie earlier, uh, like putting communist lipstick on the proverbial capitalist pig or imperialist pig or whatever else. It's very hard for me to see this. Um, in the sort of rosy terms where we've been contorting to show how it still conforms to the slogans and ideology um, of Marxism and of the old Chinese Communist Party. You know, they found a way to keep ruling as a one-party system uh, while getting all of the energy coming in to the economic growth from their capitalist reforms. And I find that uh, very telling uh, that how the people they're lifting out of poverty, that's because they did such a piss poor job of lifting anyone out of poverty during Mao's years in power uh, until they went to the Deng Xiaoping reforms bit by bit with those farmers holding on to their surpluses secretively. And I'm glad you pointed that uh, anecdote out for the whole room. And also the, the export orientation, you know, really plugging themselves into globalization. Uh, even if now they're starting to have more ambitions towards internal development, but we know that they're still racing against time to develop rural western China and that it's very much two societies, the east and west of China, and they're moving the, the line of economic development, pushing it further west the best they can, 
but you also talked about the Uyghurs, a few people mentioned Tibet. Uh, this comes with great political and social costs um, when they push up against the minorities. And I, I must say that when I hear people salivate over some of these prospects, this is the left-wing version of Mussolini made the trains run on time. And I've heard it about Cuban health care, and now we're hearing it about Chinese market Stalinism. It's a Mussolini made the trains run on time argument, which we in complicated and often unhappy lives in capitalist countries and democracies will sometimes uh, find the grass to appear greener on the other side of the Iron Curtain or some other proverbial fence. Anyway, I'll take the final few seconds to plug our statewide ticket one more time before Election Day. I'm wearing the t-shirt for Steve Dutner, candidate for Secretary of State, who has dynamic new ideas for automating uh, and streamlining many of the services, including the Secretary of State's police force. Many of you did not know that existed. Uh, we also have Claire Ball, the only certified public accountant running for Comptroller, basically yeah. an accounting job. Um, we have Bubba Harshi, a great guy from downstate, running as an anti-drug war attorney general candidate. We have Mike Lahaney with finance experience from Kankakee County, running for treasurer. And of course, Cash Jackson and Sanj Mohan for governor and lieutenant governor. Thank you, College of Commerce. Yeah, Andy. All right, Charlie, three minutes, sir. We got you going, Andy. Okay. Um, China is way ahead of us in looking at the future, and uh, they're going green way faster than we are. Solar, wind power, and everything else. And it appears that the Chinese leaders are way ahead of us in recognizing that they do have to do things to save their country from the ravages of the coming climate change, where the billionaire predators and criminals that run America are doing everything they can to destroy America and let Miami, Houston, who cares if these coastal cities flood? And there's a saying in America, it's not personal, it's just business. We're sorry Miami's going to be underwater, but we need our billions now. And that's, that's the uh, whole philosophy that's governing America and the Trump administration. And this thing with Judge Kavanaugh, the reason they want him on the Supreme Court, they want to find a full majority of people that are politicians masquerading as judges. And they, uh, Naomi Klein talks about this, uh, many others have. These judges have been packing the court since Reagan administration in 1982, and their goal is to roll back all regulations uh, that would cut into the profits of billionaire corporations. So get rid of pollution laws, get rid of environmental laws, get rid of it. Uh, laws that protect uh, children from bad medicines and stuff. Uh, if you sue uh, for damages, they say, well, uh, the court has, you have no standing in the court. They throw it out. Um, that's where we are. And um, Naomi Klein's book is the best wake-up call I've seen, other than uh, it's a companion book to this one. I, I mentioned earlier, Government of Wolves. A Government of Wolves, the Emerging American Police State. And it talks about what's happened in our country in the last 30 years and what has happened specifically <coughs> since the Patriot Act was enacted right after the event known as 9-11. So 9-11 is the driving force behind the Patriot Act, Department of Homeland Security, the militarization of police state uh, all over the country, SWAT teams, uh, you know, there's some little towns that have 3,000 people and they've got a tank and rocket launchers and everything else along with their SWAT team. It's a total militarization of America. It's, it's crept up on us slowly, but uh, both of these authors and many others they make the point that we have time, but the first, the first step towards citizens making a difference is learning what's happening. Don't maintain yourself in the bubble of ignorance maintained by the mainstream media. Uh, the best news site I know of, I say it every week, okay. is a thing called Common Dreams. CommonDreams.org. It's uh, news okay. without Time's numbers. Time's up. Thank you. And Charlie's up. Charlie, you're we got up. this young lady. Oh, it's, young lady. it's Woman's Day, and you gotta, you gotta watch out. They're the men. <laughs> They're in charge. Yeah. Three minutes. Yeah. They took over the country. Hi. I'm Ellen Corley. Um, thank you so much, uh, John. That was great. Uh, 
I, you know, I enjoyed meeting you before with the Cuba night, and, um, and uh, I think when I came here, I thought you were going, you know, it was communism. Um, I didn't realize it was you, and uh, it was so informative. I wish I got to the that early part. I've been thinking, as you know, I've talked about. It seems to me I kind of agree with Andy about the problem. Uh, the government of wolves and the Federalist Society, and you know, can be very, very pessimistic, mostly about the neocons, neoliberal, neo-federalist uh, society, and the neo-fascist um, trends that I see, and you know, feel like all I could do is run for mayor, and uh, you know, um, you know that it's just a power game, you know, Game of Thrones, right? And so we all need to run to try to whack them off, but you know, um, oh, feudalism is what it is. Uh, but I'm, I'm really happy to hear um, one one idea that came to me is that I, IBM did a study years ago. Um, on uh, male versus female countries. And, um, you know, the male, it seems like, is the capitalist, America's male. Um, and I, it sounds like China is more of a female type com country than I had been aware of. They're usually socialistic. Uh, I think Sweden is one. Um, but uh, we really need more females in office. Uh, I, I just, because I do think the collective idea is what works um, as opposed to see I, I my stepfather was raised me on Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman and um, so I got my MBA and um, studied capitalism but capitalism cannot be corrupt you know that I, it's like we got to somebody's got to write that paper and get it you know past the National Review and the um, Republican Party that's controlling our media I just found a document yesterday that um, it's depressing, and how can I get it across? But it was a Bill Crystal memo, um, you know, the Project for Republican Future, where he said we need to, how are we going to fight health care reform of Hillary Clinton in 1992? He was Dan Quayle's chief of staff. Um, you know, if this covert operations on America by the, the state, state-sponsored propaganda, psychological warfare uh, against the United States has got to stop. And um, but your time's you up. Can't really get there without your time's up. A miracle. So. Charlie, three minutes. Three minutes. All right. Let's thank our speaker. Where are you? Here we go, John. All right. I'm ready. Hurry up. If anybody wants it, the JB button. See me. Uh, let's see, I'll be eclectic as usual here. Uh, we heard this old story that, oh, communism doesn't work. I guess, I guess capitalism worked well under the Tsar when most of the country was living in mud huts. And I suppose capitalism worked well under the Chinese Republic for people who were living in mud huts. No, you came in the Soviet Union when in 50 years they were putting a man on the moon defeating us. Uh, as a nation, uh, militarily and uh, in the economic sphere. So I don't know what in the world we keep hearing this when it's not any, any way accurate. <laughs> now the other thing about this, we saw tonight, is that the socialists, if anything, are capable of one scale improvement projects, capital projects. Unlike the United, now the United States, we, we have 500 short lines, half of which go bankrupt. They come together and put together a 35,000 mile network using the modern technology, what they learn from other countries. It shows you how, in fact, how socialism works. They're very good at these projects where the entire community comes together to get a common goal. I mean, I've been studying China for years, even though I'm starting to learn how to read Chinese, I've been doing it. Now, the thing you left out, pal, and I gave a lecture on this here, is that the working conditions in, in China are very, very sad, are very, very bad. And nothing to be positive about. If you look at the International Labor Organization or other groups, these are in fact sweatshops. You had a map up here, and you had light blue countries in the middle of Asia. And those are the ones who are setting the standards of working conditions, because anything goes there. 
And that's who they're competing with. Yeah. Bangladesh and those other countries there in the middle of Asia there. I was looking at that map there. Um, that's what I mean. Sadly enough, and he did say, you know, this would come about improvements in the future. But no, it's, and the other thing you mentioned, plastics. One of the most hazardous things to work with, products people don't realize this, is with the plastics industry. Uh, I spoke a little bit about that. But anyhow, um, yeah, I mean, there are still long rows of uh, sweatshop employment. Uh, you may end up sleeping underneath the table if you get a break at all. And they still have situations, we get stories to the effect if you're 10 minutes late from work, you lose pay for the entire day. Anyhow, but it looks like we got some progress here. Thank you very much. Good PowerPoint. Time's All up, right. Charlie. I want one minute, not three. No, you're done. Too bad. I didn't speak yet. I'm going to take one minute. Too late, Andy. Let's if you haven't spoken, go ahead. Yeah, Just going to take there. one yeah. minute. Equal rights. Yeah. Take three. Yeah. Four. Four. <laughs> it's kind of funny uh -huh. how you guys are taking what we took as a distinctly phenomenon called capitalism and globalization and are now celebrating its implementation in China. The funny thing is, what you've just described is what the rest of the world either has or is going through. You can go back 300 years or 200 years into London's history with the migrations of people from the countryside into the, uh, into the uh, uh, cities. All you gotta do is go back and read Adam Smith, The Theory of Moral Sentiments and the Wealth of Nations. And that's exactly the game plan we've been following for years. The United States is, I'm proud to be an American, I'm proud of our capitalistic system, I'm proud of the First Amendment of equal rights, equal religion, like and everything else. And I'll tell you, as much as you guys hate it, get out of here because I love our country. Oh. <laughs> All right, John. Our speaker. Where's our speaker? John, you got the last word. You have the last word. I love our I wish I could go longer, Charlie. Can I have everybody's attention for just a second? Uh, after our speaker here wraps up, we have to kind of move to the back pretty quick because they want to start cleaning this up at quarter to nine. So try and try to gather your belongings, and we'll, we'll in about five minutes we'll start to move to the back pretty quick. Thank you. That's one minute. Okay, just Andy, go ahead and close it out. Okay. Uh, well, I, I'll just be brief because I think you're. How many minutes does he have? I, uh, About two or three. That was really interesting. Always an interesting discussion. Um, I just wanted to kind of uh, say that this theme that we have to learn to live with China. I agree with that. And uh, every, regardless of what your social system is and what you believe in, we have to cooperate together. We got some huge problems in this world, and beginning with climate change. And if we don't all pull together and work together, regardless of our beliefs, we're all, we're all going to get cooked, for crying out loud. So every country has to work together and find a way to work together and uh, to get on a path of sustainability. Um, and I, can't, I guess I want to I want to end with that because I I I feel very strongly that um, you know people from the beginning of civilization have been trying to fight for a better world and have always been trying to seek freedom you know and, uh, and have overcome all kinds of obstacles and here you have a country in my opinion where you know they've gone through social revolution and they're moving you know very in a lot, you know, slowly in a lot of ways, but also with big uh, leaps on other occasions. Uh, change takes a long time, but here you have a society that's trying to collectively, as much as possible, move everybody forward. Um, and that's that, that's 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 to me something to, that we have to study, you know, uh, further. And I think and I think appreciate. But again, as I said, not. Every country has its own path, you know, to uh, to socialism or to changes to a more equitable society. And I I believe very strongly that the United States, that our path to a more equitable society, to a socialist society, 
is going to have to be is going to be predicated on the issue around climate change. We are going to be forced. We are going to be forced as a society to have to confront it. You can't you can't go on with what we're facing with these extreme weather events and not, and, and and have a blind eye. You can't. Society has to deal with it. And therefore, what does that mean? That means we as a society have to get on a sustainable path. Regardless of what the corporations want, or these, you know, these fossil fuel corporations, we as a society has to insist on it. Uh, as a people, as a you know, as a country, uh, we also have to insist that we divert a huge part of our budget to adapting to the climate change, you know, to sea level rise, to droughts, to uh, you know, you name it. We're going to have to adapt to that, so that's going to take tremendous amounts of resources. Where is that money going to come from? It's either going to come from you and I, or from the wealthy of this country. Well, that's going to, that in itself is going to create a big social change, to take that money, tax the wealthy, and start diverting it. Or, or what about the, uh, the issues around the military budget, you know? And uh, that also has to be transitioned to a uh, peaceful and, and, and sustainable society. So anyway, I, I feel that's, the, that's kind of the core of our path. You know, going forward, and uh, thank you again for inviting me. Give a shout, Andy. All right. Hey, uh, as the speaker said, uh, climate change is the number one issue, and we are adjourned for tonight. We'll see you next week. Thank you. You give it every now and then, don't you let a little bit of that communism sink in? <laughs> I have. It could be a balance, right? China's got over 600 people now working in the thorium molten salt reactor. They're the lead, one of the world leaders in developing of alternative yeah. nuclear power. Yeah, exactly. As a matter exactly. of fact, if we're not careful, we're going to be licensing the very same technology we did during the 1960s. Our Department of Energy gave them all their basic research. And now in their tradition of completing mega projects, they can innovate over there on nuclear, and we can't. Yeah, they, you know, I, for a long time we were kind of like, oh, America's the innovators. You know, they're the doers, and we're the thinkers. They're just using our methodology that we...